This is the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Rule number one is you have to believe in yourself. You're the only one who doesn't think you belong in this appointment. The prospect has already validated your existence by scheduling time with you. Get it through your head you belong here, go in there, crush it, and close the deal. A place where sales professionals can come to learn from other sales professionals and thought leaders that have mastered their craft. The difference between a good salesperson and a best-in-class salesperson is only two minutes. By spending an extra two minutes on what you might think is a mundane task in the sales game, you separate yourselves from the pack, you grow your book of business, you close more deals, and you retain your accounts. As well as their peers who are still striving for perfection to achieve their why. I have a wife and four kids. Failure is not an option. Real sales professionals. Real stories. Real results. Are you ready to feel the power? Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Today, we are handling a public service project. We are bringing Chris Green onto the podcast so that we can teach him a little bit about flood insurance. (laughs) Doubtful. I've heard from a lot of people that Chris needs to know. And so I just I took it upon myself to bring him on here and just see what it is that the guy actually knows about flood. I mean, I don't know. Kyle, I mean, what, what do you think? I, I, I would have to imagine he knows much more than I do about flood, considering I know about 3%. And that's what we talked about last time. So well, that, well, I, I, we... I can't wait. Well, that's why we send all of our flood to him. We're smart enough to know that we don't have to know exactly, anything. right? Stay in your lane. So, what's going on, Mister Green? You're back in your traveling mode again. It looks like. Well, I was. I was supposed to be in Vegas in a couple of days, but then that got canceled because my daughter's school had some COVID issues, so I couldn't fly. Mm. So I guess my traveling is going to stop until brain share. Are you? Dri- I'm imagining you're driving to San Antonio. No, I'm flying. Are you? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I know of your uh, aversion to air travel, so I wasn't sure if you were going to just make a road trip out of it or, or what. No, I'm living on an airplane from brain share until after IOA. Wow. Unbelievable. When are you coming in for innovation? Coming in that Thursday. If you come in the wind, oh, I told you this already. If yeah. you come in that Wednesday night, come on, man, we're going to have, we're going to throw a banger. I will try to come in. The problem is I'm speaking in Nebraska with Brian Hanley at Agency of Future like a week and a half Sounds before terrible. that. And I come home like, like literally, I'm home like enough time to see my daughter's two softball games every week, and that's it. Man. That's all right. At least you're there for those, man. You can't yeah. miss that. So there's a little bit going on in the flood world right now, man. What do you, I mean, the floor is yours. Let's talk a little bit about the NFIP updates that are coming down and some of the other stuff that's happening that, uh, that you're seeing. Yeah, what, I had an opportunity what, to talk with one of your lender friends earlier this week on a call about, you know, NFIP risk rating 2.0, all these changes that are happening really in about 45 days or whenever this podcast comes out, these changes are happening October 1st. But, I mean, there's some big sweeping changes. Yeah, we're fast-tracking this one, man. This is the stuff that people want to hear. So, for example, like flood zones are no longer going to It gets the people going. Zones. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> The flood zones, go ahead, man. We're going to behave now. Sorry. The flood zones are no longer really going to determine flood rates. They're only going to reter- re- determine the requirement. Like you're going to have uh, cost to rebuild, frequency of flooding, type of flooding, distance to water. These kind of things are all going to impact rates. Uh, there's a uh, project called Claim Variable that I just shot a video and a podcast on where FEMA is giving everybody a get out of jail card free. And as soon as you have a claim, they do a 20-year look back. If you've had any more claims, what they do is they use a claim variable, maybe it's a two or a three, and they put that on top of what your max can be. Hmm. Which can be huge, you know. And so what I'm doing right now is yes, I've been traveling the country addressing all the changes in every state. Now I'm addressing every change, good, bad, and ugly in every major city across the US. What's the so deal not, with the with yeah, the changes? I'm not the smartest, hold on Go one ahead. second. I'm not the yeah. smartest guy in the world. So I'm gonna tell you what I just heard. What I just heard is that FEMA is coming out with an experience modifier for flood that's got a 20-year look back and not the three years of workers' comp. Yep. Wow. 
And you no, don't know before, what that is, by the way. <laughs> you don't know what that is unless you look back 20 years. How many people are even looking back 20 years? Can you? Is that something that you see when you go in? Because, I mean, in all seriousness, obviously, for those of you that haven't figured it out, I was being sarcastic about us educating Chris on Flood. We literally don't write Flood. If it's something that's a layup that's handed to us that makes all the sense in the world and it's five minutes to quote it with auto owners or whatever, yeah, we'll write that. But anything at all mm -hmm. that requires any level of thought or expertise expertise is automatically getting flipped over to him i mean what how much of that information do you see on the front end though we don't see any of it we actually go and do the research or we tell the client hey you know fema has privacy laws so the only person that can get access to this information is a current homeowner but during, can it be connect <laughs> yeah during your due diligence period you need you need to have this because what we find is someone goes to buy this house they have their first flood claim come to find out it flooded four times before but the property owner didn't have to disclose it because it wasn't a property disclosure state. Mm. And then all of a sudden they go back, they do the 20 year look back. They find that variable that's going to be the multiplier. And then what happens like next year, the property, the, the flood premium just goes up by that much. Yep. So they're not really saying because they're still playing with the rating system. It was supposed to be out a few weeks ago. There were some issues. So agents really can't even quote the way they need to yet to see. But yeah, that variable is going to be one of the, you know, could be one of the driving factors of a rate. So you might have an $800 rate, and as soon as you have that claim, you might have a $4,000 rate because you didn't know about those previous claims. Mm. So all these changes that you're talking about, has this just been years in the making kind of coming to fruition now, or is there a certain, did something just happen that uh, triggered all this, or like, what's the deal? No, it was the Bigger Waters Act back between 2012 and 2014 that really was supposed to come out then. There was congressional pushback, and it has been ever since then, and so they're finally able to roll it out to some point. Now, they're not, they have not changed in the forms yet. There's a lot of things that are not changing, like you're still going to get newly mapped rates. You're still going to be able to grandfather a policy, but the problem is one of the benefits of grandfather policies is you got this special rate. Well, mm -hmm. they're going to phase that out where it reach, meets the full risk, where grandfather policies are going to be almost... A, a waste of time eventually. Hmm. And is this just NFIP stuff or is it affecting the private markets too? No, just NFIP. Well, but the good news is a lot of the things private's already doing is actually what NFIP is finally starting to adopt. Uh, for example, they'll look at an area and they'll say, hey, everybody gets the same flood rate because the foundation's the same. Well, the uh -huh. risk is different. So they actually look at the property like you're no longer going to have to have an elevation certificate to get a quote. Now, it may still be very beneficial. You can either take FEMA's data or you can take an elevation certificate. Well, if it's me, I'm taking an elevation certificate all day long because at the end of the day, someone actually put their eyes on that property. Yeah, we're dealing with a little bit of a flood snafu ourselves for a client of ours. Kyle, I mean, I don't want to get into name calling and all of that, but tell Chris <clears throat> what's going on with that. Yeah, I mean, basically. Like, this is one of those that should have been a layup that is not a layup. Right. And it's, point. there's been multiple things through the entire process and it hasn't just been only flood related, but the most recent issue was due to the certificate, ha not having this particular client as uh, purchasing a new property. Um, it was, th it's three suites in this little office park. One of the, one of the addresses was left off of the certificate when the, um, inspector came out to do whatever it is that he does. Um, so when it got sent over to the carrier, they were, you know, like, yeah, we can't accept this. This is, it doesn't have the right ad there, you know, all of the addresses on here. And then the, um, I'm not sure who, who, who did it, whether it was the insured or somebody else, but they, they like wrote in the one, the, the missing address on there. And then the carrier was like, well, we need to get this initialed. And so we <laughs> send it back and we get it initialed, send it to the carrier again. They're like, the, who, whose initials are these <laughs> like these are not the person who did the initial uh you know certificate that's it's a totally well, different they company a data, they have an initials database somewhere uh, that they well, went well, cross-referenced well it was no but i mean it's stupid like you can t like if the guy's name is is bob smith and then the next the guy who initials it initials it wt it's like i mean what are you doing real name yeah that's actually so, why the surveyors have to put their stamp on there and their signature on there, because as soon as they do... Oh, do surveyors have one of those big, fancy seals that David loves? Yep. yep. Nice. But here's the key. They can only be held responsible for one piece of information, and that's the actual elevation numbers. 
anything else, like if they put the wrong diagram number, any of that stuff, they can't be held responsible for that. Now, maybe a certified engineer could, but the actual surveyor cannot. They can only be held responsible for actual elevation numbers. Hmm. Interesting. I would love a job where I'm not responsible for the primary <laughs> for function like of everything. my job. Because <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, we, we correct that every day. Like, well, like, hey, you got the wrong diagram number out here, and we'll go back, and I mean, they'll correct it, or FEMA will correct it. But yeah, I mean, that's what the, the signature there. I mean, they're basically signing off that, hey, I put my hands on this property, and I verify the elevation numbers and everything, and that's why those signatures got to match. So you have you have some tricks to get elevation certificates, don't you? Yeah, you can actually order them through our website. Yeah, so that was the next step. If we didn't get it resolved, I was actually going to – it's funny. When I heard that we were jumping on with you today, it was, it was kind of – because we were just talking about this on Monday in sales on meeting. On Monday. Uh, I was like, right. you need to just call Chris <laughs> and let him deal with it. Right. So I think um, we're well, on track with all that. Or have they just been trying to issue the policy? Say that again. Has a claim occurred or are they just trying to issue no, it? No, no. No, they're trying to issue it because, you know, he's trying to get everything wrapped up and close closed on this property. Yeah, and it's just been this – uh, just a, just a process with every, not again, not only the flood, but there's been multiple hiccups in the road and, um, you know, Kim's been doing a great job of dealing with a lot of that. So, but, um, yeah, I mean, Ashy though, Ashy, I, 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 I get as best as, as best she can. I don't know. I, I mean, so most of the issue has not been on, not most of the issue, all of the issue has not been on our end. It's been a lack of communication yeah. between the. The lender and this, you know, the elevation certificate, whatever. It's been, well, it's imagine been a, that. You got a guy that's not responsible for anything for that anything. he does, and now you're having a hard time finding him. Like, he's going to, that's the guy that's going to show up for work after payday. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's probably out of two weeks. I had a situation I had yesterday, and it was kind of a, a test situation that, honestly, a lot of insurance agents give me pushback on. It's the whole payment thing of, hey, if, you know, if you send one customer late pay, you got to send it to them all, or, you know, don't send it to any of them because you're going to create an E&O issue. Is I developed a software um, that I've worked with, and it tells us where our customers are located across the country. It tells us where our referral partners. Well, I have mapped flood watches and flood warnings on top of that. Yesterday, we wrote a policy two weeks ago for a German restaurant in Helen, Georgia. This water comes up 15 feet in a matter of hours. I have seven inches of rain. He gets a text. He gets a voicemail from us and an email telling him, hey, you probably need to evacuate your employees. He may want to look out there's a tsunami coming. <laughs> he said, cow. dude, he said, how did you even know that? He said, that water rose three hours after you sent me that notification. He said, my employees probably would have been trapped. And he said, you know, wow. he goes, Thank you. The, the building wasn't damaged. He said, but I appreciate it so much. But then everyone's like, oh, I really wouldn't do that. You're creating an E&O issue. I was like, well, at the end of the day, I'm going to do what's right for the customer. You know, I really would like to see the data of where an E&O claim has been filed because of a non-pay. Hey, look, man, you're not the flood fella. You're not the flood guy. You're the flood guru for crying out loud. That's if right. you weren't calling floods three hours before they happen, I don't, I'd have to ask you to take your hat off. <laughs> I mean, you really had nine inches of rain last night in Asheville, North Carolina, and you had seven inches yesterday in Helen, Georgia. Jeez. Yeah. I from, think that if right. you were to travel with Jim Cantori, that would be like the greatest dream team ever for hurricane relief. Storm surge. I'll tell you what your storm surge is going to be three Tuesdays from now at 437. I've got it in HubSpot. Well, actually, I did a video today, and I just released a blog and a podcast on this, though. But the uh, hurricane season, all the flooding isn't the coastal areas, it's the inland areas where they yeah. just stop. And I said, but you got all this flash flooding, these surface, like Nashville, Tennessee, Baton Rouge, Houston, um, Birmingham, Alabama. They all had major flood events this year as a result of six inches of rain in less than 12 hours. You know, it's interesting, man, because I remember this is one of the few things that I specifically remember from going through the CIC institutes. But when I was in the personal lines institute, I'll never forget the instructor was talking about the number one cause of E&O for agents in North Carolina the prior year was flood. And it was for people who lived on the side and at the bottom of mountains where the snow had melted and come down the banks. And these, none of these people had flood policies. I was actually having a conversation with my office manager about that. She goes, well, how can there be an exposure if you didn't do a policy? I said, because then the agent didn't, it, didn't it, offer it. Offer it. Right. Duty to offer, man. 
That's what I tell everybody. So, like, you know, I think everybody out there that's ever sold commercial or personal insurance, for that matter, any insurance, has that snarky person that says, oh, you're just trying to sell me everything under the sun. Well, no, actually, I have a duty to offer you everything, and you can make the responsible decision to accept or decline, but I need to have record of that because if I don't, I'm the one that's on the hook for all of mm-hmm. this, right? And I mean, that's one of the reasons a lot of people think that it's like us being, I don't know, arrogant, whatever else, but we will only work with a client if we represent all lines. Like, I don't need that because if I've got another, we've got one right now where we handle the auto for an account that was referred to me by an accounting person. And the idea was we would start with the auto because that was the immediate need. And then as things expired, we would bring it on, which is typical for us in a verbal commitment that we had. Well, guess what? We wrote the auto and we find out that this person who's an HVAC contractor is with an excess and surplus lines company for an artisan's contractor's policy that's got minimal coverage, paying about half what they should be paying with a, with a high deductible, no property coverage, nothing. I mean, just it's, it's bad. And they decide that for them to do the right thing and move to the right company, um, it just didn't make sense. It's too, ex- too expensive to do that because the premium's more money. Well, I advised, look, you need an inland marine floater uh, for contractor's equipment. You need all of these things because right now all we do is write your auto insurance. Well, guess what happens? Somebody breaks into one of the cars, steals $25,000 worth of inland marine, you know, contractor's equipment stuff, and the first thing they do is come and want to file a claim on the auto policy. I'm like, file a claim for the broken glass or any damage done to the vehicle with somebody breaking into it, but those contents aren't covered. I told you that six months ago when you told me it was too expensive for you to pay two thousand dollars more a year in premium now that two thousand dollar decision has cost you twenty five thousand i don't want to be the guy who has to say that when somebody just lost twenty five thousand dollars worth of stuff but that's the way that people think man even if you even if you're in a situation where you know, you offer it and they don't take it, they have very selective memory, right? Like these people don't mm-hmm. want to remember, oh yeah, that is, this is my fault. You did tell me it was the right thing to do. That's why we document literally everything. That's why I love HubSpot. We had a renewal that went from like 800 bucks, like four grand because of a flood risk scored in an area. And the lady's like, you never notified me. I'm like, the carrier sent you two letters, but we also sent you four emails. You open all those. We also had a voicemail delivered to you and a text sent to you, and you opened it on this date. Boom. And then they're like, oh. <laughs> yeah, oh. well, I mean, <laughs> it, it, well, and, there's nothing we can do. Yeah, so Chris uses HubSpot, too. That's, like, my favorite thing. I can't tell you the number of times that I'm getting – well, it used to be called Sidekick. Now it's just whatever they call it. But, you know, I can't tell you the number of times where I've been in a uh, – you know, deal where I see somebody that opens an email and it's like, oh, crap, I forgot to do that. Yeah. And I pick up the phone and, or the email. I'm like, hey, I just wanted to follow up and let you know I'm still working on this, blah, 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 blah. And then, like, literally seconds later, that's so weird, I man. was just I was getting, just ready, getting to ready to email you. <laughs> yeah, but no that's way. going away in the fall. So it's going to be real interesting to see what happens in the fall. Wait, what, what do you mean? mean? With the Apple update and the Google update, uh, the email tracking is going to be going away. Because what? customers will be able to opt into it, whether they want it on their phone when they go into their mail. And if they put no, you won't be able to get that notification. So mm. our renewal is coming up for our video platform, Vidyard. And a conversation I was having with them is, look, email open is going away. But we will still get notified when someone clicks on our video link. Because if we can, we can kind of use it the same way. But if that's going away as well, I mean, it's going to be like running in the dark with scissors. That's oh. interesting. first of all, that's dangerous. Don't do it. But uh, that that whole thing is interesting, man. That's um, I had no idea. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you're using the Vidyard link, if you're able to get that captured, though, at least you'll know if it hasn't been opened. You need to follow up with the client because they haven't opened it yet. You won't. That's what I'm saying. You won't know if they've opened it or not. So you so Vidyard's not even going to be able to track whether or not their videos are viewed. They're not sure yet because they're not real sure how this is going to roll out with this new update from Google and hmm. Apple. You know, is or the links? Is it just? Visible? Is it a? Fo- is it like a phone specific thing to where like it won't? It's it's allowing them that preference because it's on their cell phone. But if they're sitting at their desktop, like it'll still work. No, it's a email setting. Okay. 
But that's what's so I'm assuming so this is all stemming. Yeah, this is all stemming from that all the other crap that Google and Apple have been dealing with for the last little bit, where you have to opt in for them to track you off app and all of the other stuff. Yeah, if they opt in, you'll still be able to get it. But if they don't, and I imagine that most people, hmm. you know, most people say, won't. Yeah. yeah, interesting, man. That you've got to find different ways to know that you're, they're engaging with your content. Well, you gotta wonder too, like how's that gonna affect people like Mad Mimi and Mailchimp, who basically do nothing except track emails and send that are sent out. Like, what kind right. of analytics are they gonna be able to give you at this point if they can't track open rates? Because that was the initial for me before I ever did the HubSpot deal. I just had a, a basic email program, and I could still see who opened, who clicked. And all of that, it was just a more manual process for how I managed it on the back end. But that's going to suck, man. Yeah, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the fall. That's why I said, you know, you want me to do a two or three year contract. I got to see how this is going to play out first. Yeah, so I got to wonder, too, it's like Neoteric Agent, right? Where, you know, it's a web-based software. That's who we use all of our video quotes for, for personal lines and some of the small commercial stuff. But I was actually the original beta tester. Yeah, so when we get notified on that when somebody clicks the link to go to it. Yep. So I'm hoping that's going to be a way around the email open issue, but, I mean, nobody can really give you a, a definite answer yet. Yeah, like how could they not tell you? Like, I don't know. That, that would just clicking, be I feel like clicking on the video is a little bit different than just if you get a notification right. that somebody opened an email. Yeah. That's what we're hoping for, but I'm like, can yeah. you give me an answer? And they're like, we really don't have one yet. So let's bring it back to Flood for a minute. I mean, there's changes happening with NFIP, obviously. What's this doing to the private flood market? Because well, the private flood market is really, and this is an outsider's perspective, so I am sincerely interested in what, what your thoughts are on this. But to me, it seems like the private flood market has really evolved over the course of the last two to five years, three to five years. Way more than it was a long time ago. It's blown up the last, I'd say, even 10 years. But you know, everybody's like, oh, well, this is going to knock private flood out. I said, no. I said, the development of this program is still not doing a lot of the things of why private came into the marketplace, which was more coverage. Things like loss of use. You know, having those unique situations that FEMA doesn't have any intent in offering. I said, private's still going to be great there. Yeah, they're going to lose a little business probably back to FEMA. But at the end of the day, they really may not because, you know, FEMA doesn't do replacement costs on a lot of stuff like commercial buildings in certain situations, secondary properties. And, you know, so it's like, oh, it's going to kill, it's going to kill a private. Like, no, it's not. I said, all FEMA's doing is kind of coming up a little bit to the level of where private was already at. Why don't you talk a little bit about some of the enhancements that you can get with private flood that you wouldn't get through FEMA? Because there's some that are significant. My biggest is loss of use and loss of rent. Um, it's actually an issue that uh, we're having with a flood carrier based in Florida right now where they're like, hey, you know, why don't you do more business with us? And I'm like, you don't give us the things you need. I said, what do you mean? I said, you want to write apartment buildings, but you want to offer $5,000 in loss of use. What good does that do me on a $5 million apartment building? When I've got these other options out here we've designed where we can automatically include 10% of loss of use, where this apartment building owner can continue to, to go. And if Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac require it, and you don't offer it, why would I even waste my time? So to me, loss of use is one of the biggest thing, the replacement cost. You know, having those unique coverages for some machinery inside some of these commercial buildings that even on the FEMA form, they clearly exclude. What about hmm. waiting period? You know, I'll be honest, the waiting period really is not that big for us because we do so much new business on closings and things. But most private companies do have a waiting period that ranges between 7 days and 15 days while FEMA still has that 30 day wait period and they're, they're not changing that. So the wait period is really not that big a deal, but where I find the biggest exposure for agents are really two things is they don't tell people about the wait period. So they go and purchase this flood insurance. They have a flood and it's not covered because they didn't tell them about the wait period or like with a new NFIP risk rating 2.0, they just say, Hey, call FEMA and file a claim. They file that claim, come to find out, you know, their claim variable is now four. And that $1,000 claim, and like, well, why didn't you tell me it was going to impact me that way? All of a sudden, you've created an E&O issue because you just told them to go file the claim without explaining to them what the implications short-term and long-term were going to be on them. Yeah, it's funny because when we see the, the hurricanes get announced down here, I see all my friends that are 
personal lines agents in Florida start hammering, don't have flood insurance, you can still get it before the storm comes. I mean, <clears throat> I just always wondered about that as a tactic. Yeah. Um, I mean, how I've true can that actually there. be, he though? I mean, that's like... He said, hey, we need more competitive rates in this area. I said, rates are not competitive in your area for a reason. It's called a flood risk score. <laughs> I said, you don't want a company that comes in there and gives you all these cheap rates because the next year, you're going to have 1,000% rate renewals. You're going to have the same situation you have with homeowners in Florida right now. Mm -hmm. I'd rather pay a little exactly. bit more and create long-term rate stability over the next five to 10 years for the customer. Look, man, that's something I've been saying all, that's one of the ways that I talk to clients that are calling complaining about the increase in homeowners premiums. Like I've always very sarcastically said, I, I don't want to deal with somebody griping because their homeowners goes up $20 a year mm -hmm. <clears throat> because to me, that's nothing like in, in what we deal with in, in the commercial arena this year, people are seeing 30, 40% increases. Yeah. I can, I, I can get behind taking the time to explain to them what's going on. And you know, truthfully, we haven't had rate increases. Florida, on the homeowner's market, for the last two or three years has been n non-existent in terms of a rate increase. And part of that has to do with the fact that there was so much surplus in the reinsurance companies that they didn't have to take rate. Well, enough stuff happened last year that they ended up not having the surplus and had to take rate this year. I would have much rather seen a smaller incremental increase for two or three years in a row to get to a point where they were comfortable than hitting it all at one time. This is part of the problem that we run into because now, you know, you've got carriers pulling out, going insolvent, going into receivership, and Citizens is no longer the market of last resort. It's like the first place everybody has to go because the underwriting restrictions are so tight. That's why I laugh like all kinds of every time I see somebody say, oh, I'm, I want to get my uh, non-residence license so I can write in Florida. Uh, OK, you think that that's sexy? Feel free. While you're at it, why don't you get appointed with citizens so you can do five times the work for a third of the commission? I'll give you all of the leads for that business you want every day and it'll let me focus on what we really do. But I mean, to your point, man, when you take a hit like that all at one time, Mm hmm. It's so not, what you're saying, just like instead that. of having flat renewals for a couple of years, just, you know, whatever, five, 10. I would over have rather have seen them go up like five or 10 percent a year yeah. for the last two years. And then maybe if they needed to take a little bit more this year or they just say, look, we're going to take five to 10 percent per year for the next three to five years. Smooth it out and stabilize yeah. the rates. Don't make it consistently be up and down because this ends up being the way that the, the marketplace works here in Florida. We're going to be looking at homeowners crisis for a decade now. Like literally like this, this last five years were the best five years that I've ever seen the property market in the entire time that I've been in the industry. And now we're right back to where we were when I first got in. So I'm hard. wondering, they, uh, we just completed the acquisition of a flood insurance agency in the Northeast yesterday. And one of the reasons they came to us is we can't handle the service work. It's just not profitable for us. You know, we don't understand how it's profitable for you. And I said, well, we use VAs in a strategic way. I said, we track licensed people, what they should be doing and they shouldn't be doing. So what now is costing you $250 an hour is costing us $10 an hour, which makes us twice as profitable. And I'm like, well, we don't even want to deal with it. It's these tiny changes. And so can we just sell the book to you? Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, so yeah. I'm, going back to what you were saying there, I'm, I'm kind of curious as to the thought process behind that. And I mean, you may or may not know, but like, what is the, are, are they just trying to keep them flat because they don't want to lose the business and they figure that in a few years, everybody's going to go up anyhow. And so it may not make that big of a difference because there's, there's little, you can have some predictability in terms of like hurricane season down here, right? Like we, we generally know ahead of time if it's going to be a bad hurricane season but we don't know when and where exactly they're going to come Dude, chris green knew three months ago he just hasn't <laughs> well, sent the emails in texas yet. True. that's true i guess but i'm, I'm just wondering why that's the process we know that flooding is always going to be an issue in the spring in areas like minnesota iowa and in that area because of the snow melt coming down the mississippi and the missouri mm -hmm. river and mm -hmm. so they know that so they put moratoriums in place usually at the end of february but knowing when there's going place you know teaching someone hey you've got six feet of snow around your house here's how we need to change that six feet of snow so when the spring comes you don't have that seepage in your basement you don't have that runoff issue 
because your property was the only one that was impacted, so it's not gonna be flood insurance. You know, we just had that with a customer, and I'll be honest with you, I was a little surprised with the carrier. The carrier went and interviews the neighbors on both sides of his business, and neither one of them were impacted, so they did not claim. And he's mad hmm. they did not claim. I said, look, I gotta respect them for what they did. They did their due diligence, and they actually interviewed your neighbors. Most yeah, they didn't have to come out that. and do that. No. Mm -hmm. You need to be pissed your neighbors didn't lie for you. Well, no, no. He yeah, goes, well, seriously. This go go back to their business. The so he sends me the address, and I take the address to the carrier and say, hey, here's how it was impacted, how much was impacted. So now we're reversing on actually having the claim denial approved because we were able to show that more than two acres was impacted up the street. That's good. Yeah, well, I can so, just imagine like a, a, a big freaking clash between Ethan and Scotty if Scotty did not <laughs> lie to the flood adjuster. Oh, uh, man. Well, from my understanding of Scotty, it would probably be him that's wanting Ethan to lie about it. But Yeah. Anyhow. Scotty's still in the clink, by the way. Two and a half months later, going on three. <laughs> or how about this one? I'm working on one now that came to us from another state, and the customer reaches out to the agent and says, hey, I thought I had flood coverage. And the agent's like, oh, well, I thought you had flood coverage. Is it not covered by your uh, your bot policy? Nice. And then they, they send us the list of these properties. They're like, we thought it was covered by the bot policy. And I'm like, that could be a serious E&O issue, either if you told the customer it was covered. Now, if it lists, it clearly it's not covered. It, and if you're both mm -hmm. just assuming that, you know, that's maybe a little different situation than just telling them, oh, yeah, it's covered by your bot policy. Right. I'd still say it's equally as dangerous. I mean, yeah. one of the biggest things in the commercial world that I'm always concerned about is the fact that you can't, you know, you have to write a DIC or something to get business income on a flood policy. And I mean, if your building is inundated by water, like what are the chances you're going to have a business income claim? Pretty darn good, right? Mm -hmm. But agents, <clears throat> agents look at it, and even if they do have the forethought to – write the actual flood policy they very rarely take that extra step to make sure that the business income piece is insured now i mean it's been a while since i've written one but even writing a dic to cover business income for flood most of the time you still had a hard time getting the exact limits that you would need but at least it was something you could do you know you could get to cover them in some way shape or form so what, is, what is that just like a gap like a gap that covers what they don't have on their current policy yeah so yeah, DIC the policy is not going to pay out at all right right so a dic is a policy it's a type of property policy that you can write it's called difference in conditions and you can mm -hmm. basically cover things that are not otherwise covered so you write a standalone policy to cover things like business income for the peril of flood or i mean i suppose that people could say the, like the perils is it is it you have to list them like specifically or is it uh yeah. is, okay yeah, I mean, so I suppose that people could, could make the argument that a wind-only property policy is a DIC policy as opposed okay. to yeah. standard. We're actually I mean, working with some surplus companies, and we have the last six months that actually build a flood product that it doesn't even cover the building. All it covers is loss of use and business income because it's such a gap in the market. First of all, most agents either don't offer it or they're not really even sure how to put it on the policy the right way. And so, you know, we've been working with these surplus companies of building this product just for loss of use. Yeah, I mean, it's it. I always get concerned because I feel like that our industry, by and large, does what we need to do to get by. You know, there's very little extra effort that gets put in. And I mean, guys like you that are out there that are really diving deep into a very specific niche topic, to me, are extremely invaluable to the industry because you're a huge resource. You're a resource to the insurance industry. You're a research resource to the real estate industry, to the mortgage lenders. I mean, you have taken what you do as an insurance agent and completely flipped that to be an educator of flood risk management and mitigation first and a policy placement second, which honestly is not that much different of a business model than what we do. We're just not doing it with flood. We're doing it with workers' comp in many yeah, cases. Honestly, I learned most of it from you. I don't know about all that, but I mean, I think that I think that that's a good approach, man. And so, you know, one of the things that I would want to encourage everybody that's listening this, to this to do is if you're not asking about flood because you don't feel confident in it or you don't understand it, you have two choices in my mind. 
you can either go to watch Chris's YouTube videos, the thousands of them that are out there, and try and learn it yourself, or you can just say, you know what? I'm just going to flip it over to this guy. Let him handle it. Let him yeah. make sure that this stuff is completely taken care of. And then you don't have to worry about it, but at least you ask the question to your client. And I mean, I can tell you there is nothing to be lost by taking somebody smarter than you in a specific topic into your client. It does nothing except bolster that relationship and make it stronger. I say it every day. Look, if, if I'm not the guy, I can promise you I know the guy, mm -hmm. period. And you still get paid you know, commission. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's things, there's just, there's things I'm not going to take the time to learn or know and, you know, with some of the stuff that we do, when you get into loss control and hyper-focused things like ergonomics and doing noise studies and things like that, I'm not going to do that. Why would right. I do that? I'll bring the guy in that knows how to do that or the lady that knows how to do that. They're the experts. I want my client to get best in class and not settle for whatever I can cobble together, you know, with my own skill set or inside the agency, but I mean, you're doing a ton. You, you've already alleged you, 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 or uh, mentioned that you're going to Nebraska to talk. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> talk a little bit about what, what you're doing from an educational mm -hmm. standpoint right now, but I also want you to spend some time just walking people through what you're doing for other agents. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know you do a ton of work with captives, but there's a lot of room for independents to be able to refer business into you as well, and it's a mutually beneficial thing. So why don't you talk about that for a little bit? Yeah, really the first thing I'll tell you this is like our office manager, I got some feedback on her that day and an independent agent was like, man, I've never talked to someone who was no, not so knowledgeable about flood. You know, she knew basically every answer. And I was like, she came to us in November and she had written one flood policy with her previous employer. Really knew nothing about flood. Like I tell them, I said, look, people have certain characteristics. If I can find people with those characteristics, I can teach them everything about flood in three months. And so, you know, she's really helped me with all that where now I can take more of a, a training role and more of a public speaking role as I'm trying to with our company to teach these agents, hey, this can be a win-win for the customer and the carrier. Imagine if you could create a plan, a mitigation plan, you go to the carrier and you show them how you're reducing the risk and the opportunity for claims to occur. And as a result, those premiums are going down for the customer because the risk is being reduced. It's a win-win. And I said, I don't care if it's flood or whatever. Try to take that approach with your carriers and see what kind of pushback you're going to get. Most of them are going to be completely shocked, but right? absolutely we're willing to take that risk. And so that's what we're doing with a lot of those captives and independents is trying to teach them, hey, let's look at the risk reduction first. Let's look at the insurance second. Everyone's like, oh, I just need to get a quote on flood insurance. I said, well, we really don't do a quote. Let me explain our process. We run a zone determination. We make sure you're in the right flood zone. Then we run a flood risk analysis. And we tell you what the flood zone is, what it means, and then we'll start that breakdown of coverages is when you would actually use them. Oh, and this is all by video. So it actually explains it to the customer step by step as they're going through that. And most of the customers are like, I mean, or the agents are even like, the proposal is amazing. At that point, they can click if they're ready to buy. They got more questions or they're not ready. And it takes them down other video funnels as well, explaining different things to them. And all those videos are coming directly from me. I think what you just said there about explaining how the policy would respond and what type of events would trigger each part is huge. And I would almost have to guarantee that no one else really does that or that you do it much, much better than anyone else does. I mean, that's, that's something because people always want to know when they're buying insurance, they're like, okay, you know, uh, there's, we talked about it a little bit earlier, like people, you know, sometimes think it's a, it's a scam or that, you know, they, they don't really need to buy well, this look, stuff. Dude, and they're here's, being... here's the number one thing with flood insurance. Hey, I think we should probably talk about flood. I'm not in a flood zone. Okay, does that mean you right. can't have a flood because you're not in a yeah, flood exactly. zone? Yeah, exactly. It's so like those people who think that they've never had a claim, so they don't need insurance. Um, yeah. Do your in-laws show up to your door unannounced? No. <laughs> no. Like, you know, mine do. Now, I have a great relationship with them, but what about a family member that just randomly shows up uninvited? What's the difference between something's, them and Something's flood? wrong. Yeah, yeah, we're always looking over our shoulder for that family member, I can assure you, because we have one. Well, and it's always at the worst time. It's the same thing with flood water. You think they look the flood water looks down and says, "Oh, that's not a flood zone. I can't go in there." Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, here's the thing, man. If if you boil it down, you know, I think there's an aura or a mystique or or just a. It's to me, it's kind of like the whole life insurance piece, right? We should be talking to every one of our clients about life insurance. Period. Just asking the question, but we don't. Why? Well, we don't understand it. We don't really do it enough. We're not comfortable with it. We don't 
<clears throat> we don't want to say the wrong thing. We don't want to lose the deal that we have because we bring up that one more thing. But, you know, if you look at Flood and you boil it down, the number one place that I think that I would camp out, and I think every agent should camp out, before they make a determination one way or the other as to how much effort they're going to put into this is understanding what the definition of a flood is, right? Like how do you, like Chris just mentioned the two acres or fair point. the adjacent yeah. properties and all of that. I can tell you right now, being completely transparent, if you put a gun to my head and ask me to recite what the definition of a flood is or one of my kids is going to get knocked off, I better black out like Will Ferrell in old school and just pull one out of my rear end because I'm not going to remember it. I yeah. mean, I can fumble through it, but at the end of the day, I don't know it like I know, like, oh, yeah, you know, if it's under the split point, it's going to be reduced by 70% if it's a medical-only comp claim. I know that. Right. Can't do that with flood. I'm not a student of it. I don't want to be a student of it. Why? Because if I'm not the guy, I know the guy. And I got, I'm, I've got the guy here right now. But the be, guru, you, not the guys, guy. What, yeah, He's not the yeah, flood guy. You, yeah, you're right. It is. It's the good. He's the flood guru. Well, for example, I see online a lot of other insurance companies, insurance agents will send me a link for them and say, hey, you should try this. I said, look, they focus solely on the get a cheap quote process. We're mm -hmm. not in that game. We're in the risk reduction game because that yeah. cheap flood quote's not going to do you any good when it doesn't pay out because you didn't know even what was covered under a flood. Exactly. And that, that's the point I was trying to make is I think that's huge. And, and you explaining your process up front with people, I mean, is is massive in, in I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that's the way to do it. Well, I mean, yeah, the there's so many things. Come, hey, maybe we can change you from a high risk to a low risk flood zone. That could help increase your property value, but it doesn't mean you need to cancel this policy. Right. Yeah, and I think there's so much stuff that's happening now with the exclusion of, you know, backup and the exclusion, you know, the water damage exclusion or the sublimit for water damage and all of that. Not that that stuff is even the same thing, right? Because it's not. But again, it goes back to understanding what is the very basic definition of a flood. What does it cover? And then how does that differ from the water damage provision in a homeowner's policy? How does it differ from, you know, sump overflow and sewer backup and all of that mm -hmm. other stuff? And then understanding how all of those things get married together to make sure that people are covered, you know, and I was always taught coming through the ranks that if something is excluded on an insurance policy, it's typically because it's better covered on its own policy somewhere, you know? And so just because, just because you have a, but what I would caution people is just because you have a flood policy doesn't mean that if the hose to the washer busts, you know, busts and floods somebody's home while they're gone, that a flood policy is going to cover that. That's not what a flood policy does. That's a water damage policy. Right. Well, that's a big, that's actually a big thing with swimming pools right now. Everyone's like, well, um, that's not covered by my home insurance. No, but it can be covered by flood. Well, rainfall didn't cause that. Listen to the definition of a flood. Normally dry land that's been inundated with water. If it meets the other definition of two acres or more or two properties. So if your house and the neighbor's house is flooded, it very well could be a flood claim because we just had. Yeah, if my pool crests, out. if my pool crests, it's taken out my neighbor, yes. too. I can assure you because of the way our neighbor, our street's set up. People don't think about that. They're like, oh, that's not flood. No, you're thinking rainfall and surface water. Read the definition of normally dry inundated land. Yeah, I've got one right now that I'm dealing with for one of my clients who has water damage to the wooden floor by the door to their office it's a it's a medical practice and in the entryway has damaged wood to the door because water has been coming in underneath the um whatever that word is i forget it it's not transom what's that word i don't know i have no idea what you're talking threshold. about threshold like threshold okay, okay you carry go. your bride over the threshold after you get married but they said well you know is this something we need a flood policy for I said, that's not flood you know, at all. And they said, well, we don't have coverage here and here. I'm like, I've, I've read everything on your policy. I know what you don't have. And I said, file the claim. <laughs> I mean, it's not my job to tell you whether or not you have coverage. You know, I can, I can tell you whether or not, you know, where, how I think it's going to go maybe, but at the end of the day, it's, it's the carrier's job to determine whether or not a claim exists, you know, or not. And then if we don't agree with that, we can appeal it, fight it, whatever else. But we need to let them come in and investigate and determine whether or not your actual business owner's policy is going to cover this because it's not a flood policy. And that's where we come into play with them with helping them build, a, I call it a disaster mitigation plan. Hey, this is part of a maintenance plan. 
you got a water runoff issue. Let's help you fix this water issue so you don't have water damage that's not covered by flood. And then when you go and get a flood quote from somebody, you've got to answer that, yes, I have had you know, water damage in the past as a result of this, and it throws you out of the game. So talk about your MGA, man. Talk about what the tools are, how people can get engaged with you, um, and start sending you some business. I so said, we try to make it as easy as possible. Our job is to make the other agents kind of look like a rock star. You know, our job is to help them look, produce that risk overall. And so with the NGA, you know, we've been doing this a lot with independent agents. Of course, with captives, we have no problem doing that, but their contracts usually stop them from kind of participating in that way where we can pay them a new business commission renewal. You know, we build all these referral links out for all these referral partners. So if they want to send us directly to the customer, great. But what we're doing at the end of the day is we're actually redirecting your customer to leave a review on your Google page or your Facebook page to drive business through your page. We're handling all the service. We're handling everything. That's awesome. And so where do they go to sign up to do that with you? If you go to our website, floodinsuranceguru.com. I've actually got a tab on there that's just for agents. If you want to reach out to us, um, if you're an IOA, I think there's a special form in IOA that you can reach out to us as well. Cause we talk to a lot of agents in there every day. Nice. Cool. What haven't we talked about, man? Oh, dude, Great. I know how about one your, thing. How about your massive, your massive outdoor cooking setup that you've got now? Like, Kyle, this guy. I mean, I, it'd be easier for me to tell you what he doesn't have than what <laughs> than what he has. Like, it's literally, it's, yeah. it's insane. I've never seen anything like it in my life. So I used four different grills to cook dinner the other night. <laughs> that just <laughs> seems ridiculous. Dude, it's, it's one table with the pellet smokers. And I got this from David. It's actually David's fault. So my wife won't really be talking to David. But he I'm says that. Like, I'm going to meet his mother. wife. And, yeah, I'm going to meet his wife one day, and she's not even going to say anything to me. She's going to walk up and punch <laughs> me in the face. <laughs> or Cameron or Ed Cooper. Yeah. But I bought them because it's kind of set and forget it. But, dude, I'll tell you, it's so easy. But, I mean, I enjoy it. But we pull in so much business from my, my cooking shows I do on YouTube and Facebook and stuff. Because it gives people a different way to relate to us. Like, I picked up a captive agent. We handle all his flood business because he starts sending me messages and had tips about buying a Blackstone grill and recipes and what he should cook on there. And I used that to build a relationship. Huh. Interesting. Nice. So what, so what, what the hell were you cooking the other day that required four grills? Well, you know, I didn't have to use four grills, but I did. But you I did. <laughs> like, I was doing biscuits and uh, smoked ham on one. I was doing bacon on another one, and I had some sausage going on my Blackstone. Okay. Biscuits on the grill? Oh, yeah. Put them, uh, you get these cooking grids where you don't have to put them directly on there, and it works out. The nonstick cooking mats works out perfectly. I put them on there mm. for 10 minutes, and they're good to go. Just shut the lid, and they're done. Yep. Set it at 350. Nice. There now, you go. I have to kind of phase it in. My wife's not a big smoke fan. So I have to cook at a higher temperature so we don't get as much smoke flavor. But yeah. like I did I smoked pecans the other night that everybody really enjoyed. Oh, there you go. But what's really great is I can actually turn the grills on straight from my uh, phone. Okay. All of them? Uh, there's the pellet two smoker, too? Yeah. Like yeah. If, I, if I'm in the state of Tennessee and my wife wants to cook dinner, I could turn the grill on from home on my phone. Nice. There you go. You know... um, that's the one downside to the Traeger is you can't turn it on from your phone. I can shut it down. I can control it once it's up and running and all of that, but I can't turn it on from my phone. Um, but I'm smoking some bacon tonight. I got, I've had my pork belly sitting in there for about a week. We've been flipping it every other day and the curing salts and I'm putting her on and smoking her tonight for sure. I'll show, I'll show nice. my wife the photos and she wasn't too happy. What's that? Oh, my Canadian bacon. <laughs> She, she, she loves bacon. I was getting her lunch yesterday from Subway, and they're, they're cooking her bacon. The microwave catches on fire. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> That's not a surprise. Well, yeah. listen, I want to get wrapped up, but I'm going to tell you something, people. You need to listen to what this man says because I'm going to give you some real-life proof. Last year or earlier this year, I don't remember exactly when it was, Chris Green spent a ton of time in Arizona – and he was talking about Arizona and how it has more floods than any other state in the country. And I watched his other agents thought this guy was nuts. 
and didn't know what he was talking about. They think that it's all desert, and they couldn't understand why he would be spending that much time there. I truthfully did not know there was such a thing as monsoon season in Arizona, but when I started seeing hmm. pictures from my friends that live there and the torrential downpours that they were having, it makes the afternoon thunder bangers we get here look like nothing. Really? It's insane to see how much rain was coming down, how fast it was coming down, and look, I'm not a geologist or a topographer or anything else, but I can tell I can make I'm a simple man, and I know there's a lot of hard surfaces in Arizona, and those hard surfaces aren't going to let that water you know, just absorb and go away. It's got to go somewhere. Hmm. And so talk about that for a second, man, because you, you've tried telling everybody, and people just sort of laughed. I thought you know, people thought you were joking or whatever else. It isn't a joke anymore because I saw people getting hammered this year. So I'm actually trying to hire our next team member out of Arizona because most of our business comes out of Arizona now. And everyone's like, I don't get it. It's a desert. I said, what happens to water when you put it on cement? It runs down a hill. It settles somewhere. What do you think happens in the desert when the land is that dry? There's no runoff. I mean, there, there's no way to soak the water into the ground. You get an inch of rain there, it's like getting six inches here yesterday. And monsoon season, which is generally from like May to October, they have this small window, and they just get killed during monsoon season. But then what they don't realize is like the required flood zones and all that stuff. Most of the time, it's because of these canals and these monsoons that cause all this puddling and so that's why we do so much business in arizona nevada you know new mexico that desert area yeah all i'm telling you people is listen if the, if the dude he's like jim cantori from the weather channel people in florida don't get concerned about a hurricane until they see jim cantori show up then they know there's a problem if you see the guru Wearing his poop hat, filming in your neighborhood, probably need to review the flood coverage because there's a reason he's there. This guy doesn't travel the country talking about where there's not going to be a flood problem. That's not how he operates. So if you're an agent out there, you're not talking about flood, you're not writing flood, you're not even referring flood, Chris Green, the flood guru, needs to be your best friend. He can help you. He helps me and Kyle personally with our business except for the one that we thought was an easy layup that we should have just said, let Green handle it. Yes. Lesson learned. Lesson learned. Chris, I appreciate you taking time to come on today, man. Always a pleasure. Look forward to seeing you here in person in a couple of months if I don't see you before innovation um, soon. I'll see you at BrainShare, I think. You will see me at BrainShare. That's right. Well, if I can pry you away from Marcus Sheridan, I'll see you at BrainShare. I'm supposed to have dinner with him one night while I'm there, so we'll see what happens. Cool deal. Well, listen, man, I appreciate you coming on. Have a great week, brother. We'll Thank talk you. soon, man. You've been listening to the Power Producers Podcast. You can follow Killing Commercial Insurance on Facebook and YouTube. And if you want to take your game to the next level, next level, check out our book, The Extra Two Minutes, and our website, killingcommercial.com.